Um, so we'll we'll start this off <laughs> officially, I guess. Uh, so we're very pleased to have Richard Miller here. He's the director of the University of Michigan um, Center for Biology or Aging Biology Research. And uh, he's been in the field for quite a while. And uh, and uh, we're very grateful that he can take some time to spend to talk with us about uh, aging and um, take some questions. And I, just, can you uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, I'm a professor of pathology at the University of Michigan. I've been doing aging research roughly since 1982. My lab spends most of its time working on mice. We have a lot of mutations that keep the mice alive, maybe 40% longer than normal. We also uh, have a couple of diets that do the same thing. And also, we are also working on uh, discovering drugs that slow aging and extend healthy lifespan in mice. About a quarter of the lab works across species. We have cell lines from long and short-lived birds, long and short-lived primates, long and short-lived rodents, etc., And we study them to try to figure out what are the common characteristics of uh, the cells from the longer-lived critters. Since I'm not sure uh, who this um, discussion is aimed at, has everybody here had a lot of biology? Is is that the audience? <laughs> is everybody yeah, I think sort of a researcher? Kind of a, yeah, yeah, they're they're aware of like um, basic biology and and whatnot. So it's going to be a little bit. Um, I think it, once you hear some of these questions, maybe it'll be okay. it'll be a little bit more. Uh, so we'll just start. We'll just launch into some questions that were taken from uh, the forum. And um, so I'll start with this one, which is extremely specific. Um, do you think most putative aging companies currently pursue single disease approaches as opposed to systemic approaches, such as with Mayo Clinic's Ficetin trials, due to aging not being recognized as a disease by regulatory bodies? I think companies that want to make a profit understand that the FDA will only approve drugs that have a specific disease indication. And so um, they try to come up with ideas sort of from the aging research literature and try to make a case that they are good for treating or preventing a specific disease because otherwise the FDA won't let them uh, pursue a new drug application. The other approach is to pretend it's not due to uh, not not supposed to treat a disease so that they can allege that it's a nutritional supplement and that way they can dodge under the FDA scrutiny uh, a, a, a wrinkle in the law that is obviously designed to protect nutritional supplement salespeople who don't have to prove their stuff does anything. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go from what, one, for, one forum question and then bounce to the audience. If anybody here wants to ask uh, a question directly, and we'll just kind of go back and forth like that. <laughs> Some of you had questions like five minutes ago. <laughs> uh, hello? I was going to hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I was sort of holding onto questions, thinking that the ones posted on the subreddit um, were the priority, but I don't mind asking some of the stuff that we were discussing prior to this podcast or interview. So um, one of the questions that we were wondering about was um, how, if at all, has COVID uh, affected you and, and the the lab and the aging landscape? Well, um, the research labs at Michigan were shut down more or less completely for about two months. People who had absolutely essential jobs like feed the mice, they got special permission to come in and do that. Uh, then they opened us up at about 35% capacity for two months, and now we're up to about 45% capacity. So programs that were in progress were almost uniformly slowed down by two to four months, and the work that's now underway is also proceeding much more slowly than it otherwise would. 
it hasn't been crippling, but um, the, the research programs have been delayed, uh, as, as you can imagine. Some of the people who work in the lab routinely are also not really able to meet their obligations because um, uh, they often have childcare responsibilities. They don't want their kids to go to schools and become infected. And so the kids stay home or they're in a school district where almost all the instruction is remote and they can't let the kid manage his or her own remote education. So they are, um, instead of able to work five days a week, um, they're able to work one or two days a week and maybe sneak in one day at home doing remote stuff. Uh, and that's also obviously been a serious problem for them and a major problem for the lab as well. Mm -hmm. Um, has your view on the SENS approach changed since the Flying Pigs letter? I haven't been paying any attention to anything Aubrey or SENS say since about the last 10 or 15 years. So I'm not an authority. It's possible that um, things have changed, though I rather doubt it's changed radically. At the time, it was complete nonsense and marketing and hype. Um, Nothing that I've seen since then has convinced me that they're doing serious science. I, I think they've raised money and funded a small number of inexpensive projects by junior scientists. I don't know those projects in detail. Many of them may have some merit. I, I, I can't say one way or the other. Um, the, Aubrey is a, um, a wonder at marketing and fooling uh, press people. And, and he's a clickbait artist, but it's not serious scientific thought. Um, sir, forgive me for jumping in without being knowledgeable of your background, but could you um, give us a sense of whether or not, I guess, um, the, any sort of philosophical paradigm has changed throughout the decades for focus on longevity, whether it's cellular senescence or inflammation or caloric restriction memetics or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and. Um... You know, it deserves a one hour answer, but I'll give it a one or two minute answer uh, if, if I can get away with that. Um, things have changed a lot, at least the way I think about aging. I, I, you know, everybody has his or her own way of sort of framing the question. But many people in, you know, the 1980s, and I was one of them, thought the key thing was to discover the cause of aging or the aging process or what that what it meant the aging process meant in terms of cellular and molecular biology they wanted to know if there were genes that could cause aging or slow aging currently i th i think that's a bad way to think about it uh, what what we really want to know is not so much what is the cause of aging but what are the mechanisms that biology can evolve or which we can mimic through interventions that slow aging down that slow the process down um, I, I think a lot of the things that go wrong with us as we go age have a diversity of causes. Proteins get cross-linked and so you get cataracts and some cells die and so you may have Alzheimer's disease and some control circuits uh, go into overdrive and blunt immune responses. There are dozens of ways uh, that things gradually as a person or a mouse or a horse or dog ages make function much more difficult. Uh, those are the aging process, and it has many different aspects. The key point, the thing that, uh, I don't know, took, took me a decade or two to realize and to figure out, um, is that they all go quickly in a mouse, and they go slightly slower in a, a dog, and a lot slower in a chimp, and slower still in us, and slower still in a whale. So evolution has figured out really good ways, which we need now to learn more about, <clears throat> for retarding a vast array of age-sensitive damage together. I'd like to know how nature does that. The fact th that it can also be done in individual animals is the second major new, in a sense, philosophical or framework finding. It's been known more or less since the 1930s that calorie restriction can slow down nearly every aspect of aging. Those, not only the parts that lead to death, but also the parts that lead to 
cognitive failure and cataracts and hearing loss, et cetera, et cetera, immune function, et cetera. So anyone paying attention to the cal restriction literature should have been able to figure out that there is an underlying control mechanism that regulates the pace at which aging leads to all these different kinds of changes. Now, it should be doubly or triply obvious because we have um, a handful of single gene mutations that can do the same thing and uh, four drugs that can do the same thing. When you give them to mice, they slow the whole process down and slow down aging in multiple tissues and extracellular materials, et cetera. So all of this argument, I think aging is due to protein cross-linking, or I think aging is due to what happens in the hypothalamus, or I think aging is all due to telomere-mediated shortening or something. And people fight us whether their thing is the thing that causes aging or represents aging or something. I think all of those people have missed the main point, which is that the aging process leads to all these things, and we would like to know why it leads to all these things at the same time, and why the pace, the scale, of this process um, can be as short as a couple of years in a mouse or as long as 70 years in us, even though we have all the same cells as the mice, we have all the same organs, we have all the same hormones. That's, you know, we are basically in most key and essential ways built an awful life like a mouse or a dog or a chimp. That's the philosophical framework. Uh, and it's not just a matter of, you know, drinking beer at the bar after a meeting and people are arguing about whether their idea is correct. People who cling to the wrong idea will spend their whole lives, will <clears throat> waste their whole lives studying something that they've convinced themselves is the critical factor. And if it's not the critical factor, that's kind of a shame. That's burning up a life or two or three or 10 and a lot of money. Um, just to add on a slightly to that, do you think that natural selection pushes um, our lifespans to be longer or shorter? Uh, like, you, do you think that the drift, like, is nature, <clears throat> is nature trying to, drifting towards the longest possible lifespan or is it drifting towards the shortest possible lifespan? Well, ne neither is the answer. Uh, nature is drifting towards producing a lot of grandchildren. Uh, if you're a mouse, if you're a dog, if you're an aardvark, whatever, uh, what nature is selecting for is combinations of genes which in that particular environment produce healthy, fertile kids, and they produce healthy, fertile grandkids, and they produce healthy, fertile great-grandkids. Now, in environments like the one where a mouse lives, um, to do that success, mice are very vulnerable. Uh, most mice die in real life out in the wild, on the barn within six months before they starve to death, they get eaten by the cat or they freeze to death. Um, so if, if you're evolving a successful mouse, what you want is a lot of baby mice right now. You want them in eight weeks. If you wait too long, you're gonna get eaten by the cat. But if you're a porcupine, you don't have to do that because nothing wants to eat a porcupine for fairly obvious reasons. Um, similarly, chimpanzees, it takes them two or three or four or five years or 10 years to get to the point where the kids are grown up enough to eat for themselves and to deal with the social environment that's necessary for reproductive success. So if you're evolving into a different niche, like the chimp niche, eating you is not very, thinks eating you is not likely, there's more or less enough to eat. What counts is learning wisdom, learning social skills. Um, their evolution has, has got to postpone stuff for 10 to 15 years. Uh, for a mouse, it didn't have to. So evolution is pushing always for reproductive success in a given niche. Now those niches like ours that pay off in terms of um, having small litters, one or at most two babies, but having a long period of time to have them, not just the first eight weeks of life, but 20 years to have them, that obviously you need to build in a brain that works for 25 years and eyes that work for 25 years and anti-cancer defenses that work for 25 years. And what's I think almost certainly going on is nature's doing that by slowing the aging process, by evolving changes in a small set of genes, which I would really like to identify that can postpone a vast array of age sensitive 
uh, decrepitudes all at the same time. The, the idea that a, nature selects for short life is actually a logical fallacy. If, if you have a group of animals that live, um, I don't know, five years, genes that shorten the lifespan to two years, they get wiped out for obvious reasons. All your buddies are reproducing for five years. You've, you've got a gene that makes you reproduce for only two years, you're out of there. So nature never selects for short lifespan. She may select for rapid reproduction, which is a different thing. Okay, so um, we're gonna open up to the floor again. Does anybody else have a question? There's a lot of people here, actually. Well, um, I have a question. Is it correct to say that uh, the evolutionary selection pressures are different? when it comes to R and K selection strategies? Sure, that's the definition of R and K selection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So- um, Absolutely right, you got it. Is there some way that doesn't take multiple human generations where we can sort of induce uh, evolution in humans? Uh, sure, no problem at all. Um, you simply, if you want everybody to have blue eyes, you find all the brown eyed people and throw them away, one generation. <laughs> only blue eyes. I don't recommend that. <laughs> but I, I mean, the, the dramatic example, of course, is the change in moth colors as smoke pollutes all of England in the in the 1800s. A couple generations is enough to change the winning moth wing color. And also a couple generations is enough to change them back. Um, in, in relationship to aging, the, the, my, the most fun, ex, not experiment, but observation is actually one made by Steve Alstad. Uh, which he published by now almost 30 years ago. There's an island, Sapelo Island, which is off the coast of Georgia. Um, and there are possums that live on it. And the island was connected to the mainland uh, up until about 3,000 years ago when the sea levels rose and separated. So once the, the, the water came between Sapelo Island and Georgia, the opossums on the island couldn't get to the mainland and vice versa. And so Sapelo Island is too small to support the predators that eat opossums. So suddenly, suddenly that is over the, the course of the 100 years or so when the water was going up, suddenly the opossums on the island found themselves in a brand new environment which had no predators. And when Alstead came along in 1990, um, he was able to show that they have slower aging. Um, he looked for instance at college and cross-linking and when you just, use the collagen cross-linking, the island opossums are aging much more slowly than the ones back on the mainland. Um, an opossum generation is maybe a year or so. So it only took about 2000 generations to dramatically change the uh, rate of aging in this opossum population. Um, that, that's a fun story to tell. And other examples of that sort require natural experiments. Uh, unless, uh, uh, you can, uh, to, to see if it's, it's true in the wild. In mice, you can select um, on small body size for about 15 generations. When you're selecting for small body size, you're selecting more or less for low growth hormone or low IGF-1 or low responses to growth hormone and IGF-1. Uh, when you do that, you get a lot of small mice and they live longer, just like dwarf mice with a single gene mutation that uh, removes growth hormone, they live 40% longer than normal. But if, if you don't want to use a single gene, if you just select for about 50, it takes about 15 generations, always picking the smallest babies each, each round, you eventually wind up with several lines of mice that are smaller than normal. And we got them and we tested their lifespan, predicting that they'd be long lived and by gosh, they were. Um. Do you, have you seen any longevity boosts that don't come with a trade-off, like with uh, dwarf mice or something like that? Yeah, it's that's easy. Um, if you've ever had a Cairn Terrier or West Highland White Terrier or any little dog, um, little dogs live all oh, 60, 70 percent longer than the very biggest dogs, Great Danes, Mastiffs, Wolfhounds, etc. Um, and they don't seem weak or impaired to me. They seem great. Well, but they're, I mean, they're smaller though. So it's like, if they got in a fight with that giant dog, they would probably, you know, lose the fight. Oh, yeah, no, it depends upon what task you want them to do. If, if the task is, can you get into a rat hole and catch the rat? 
the terriers are terrific at that and the wolfhounds are rotten. Uh, these, uh, the really big ones are selected for specific skills like be scary to robbers. And the littler dogs are selected for other skills like get into the rat hole or sit on the uh, queen's lap, that sort of stuff. Um, so they're being selected to a purpose. But the, the key point here is they don't show any physiological impairments. When you look at a single gene mutation that produces a dwarf mouse, everybody says, oh, they freeze to death. They'd be terrible in a refrigerator. So they're not fit. And that, that's true. Uh, but it's easily possible. The dog breeders in the space of about 100 years have made 20 or 30 different kinds of dogs that are long-lived. They're almost always selecting for a mo moderation, small size, because of low growth hormone or IGF-1 or both. Um, and it just takes 10 or 20 generations to give you an animal where the lifespan has gone up 40 or 50 percent. Not a problem. And of course, evolution has made us and also made orangutans and gorillas and albatrosses and naked mole rats and porcupines and turtles. We're all quite healthy. Uh, we, we all survive in a natural environment for hundreds of thousands of years. And we don't show any physiological um, disabilities, except, of course, the, the human need for power. Uh, and we're fairly long lives. So yeah, it's possible to make long lives critters whose um, weaknesses can be concealed appropriately in the, their environment. Isn't there a problem with the, the human reproductive system and the extremity of the size of the human cranium? We seem to have solved it. All of my ancestors dating back to the last break with uh, the uh, chimp human dyad uh, seem to have had babies. So they did a pretty good job. Yeah, I, I take your point. There, uh, there are some uh, obstetrical problems that evolution has had to solve and it's not a perfect solution, but it seems to work well enough. Um. Let's see. Oh, here's something. Someone asked, any prospects for funded RCTs like, oh, oh. <clears throat> sorry, this was a really long one, but it was, um, they, they were mentioned about using uh, a high dose rapamycin, about 20 milligrams pulsed weekly. And they were wondering if there were any prospects for those kinds of uh, studies. Is this person interested in mice or in humans? Um, I think it was human. Yeah. So, uh, A, I don't do human research. So I'm an amateur here, just like most of you, I suspect, don't do human clinical research. Um, what I pick up, I pick up from talking with friends and colleagues and, and uh, reading the literature just like you do. So um, I think if you are designing a short-term clinical trial of a drug, where you're gonna treat somebody for a few weeks, maybe even a year or two. Obviously the first concern is you don't wanna give them something that's gonna hurt them. And a drug like rapamycin, which has a very wide range of effects, in some doses it's, it's immunostimulatory, but in others it's immunosuppressive. Some doses cause GI upset, some doses can cause wound healing problems, some doses can cause blisters, painful blisters in the mouth. Um, so if you, were the kind of person who wanted to develop a randomized clinical trial for rapamycin for a short-term indication, these are things you're gonna really need to work out very carefully, both for ethical grounds and because nobody's gonna let you do it unless you're pretty darn sure the risk to benefit ratio is, is uh, very, very low. Now, that's not a study of aging. Aging studies are even worse. If, you, if the thing you really want to know is, if I start taking rapamycin when I'm 50, how, what happens to my chances of being healthy at 80 or 90? That's a 30 or 40 year study. And making a case that any dose of some more or less untested drug for 30 or 40 years isn't gonna hurt you, that's a really hard thing to prove. So I think, uh, for both financial reasons as well as reasons of practicality, uh, people who are anticipating using drugs that were used in aging research 
to treat people are not that interested in using them to slow aging in people, which would be enormously expensive and take a very long time. They, they kind of vaguely hope that the stuff would slow down a disease, even if given to an old person. And it might, you never know. If the logic there is not obvious, but it may be that the drug is good for you anyway. And there's some drugs, metformin is by now the sort of poster child for this kind of research, uh, for which there is a very long history of human use in diabetics, mostly in pre-diabetics to show that it really doesn't hurt you. <laughs> the safety profile for metformin is, is um, quite impressive. And so it's not too hard to make a case for giving metformin to people for a few years, even if the argument that in so doing you are going to slow the aging process requires you to sort of not, not look that carefully at the evidence, which people are good at doing. They're very good at not looking carefully at the evidence. It may still be a good drug. Um, I'm going to open up the, anybody else have any questions? Yes, in the same vein of um, metformin, I wonder, is there an argument to be made for low sugar diets or attempts to reduce the serum glucose levels? So let me say two things about that. Um, regular old normal nutritional science has made it really clear Sugar is bad for you. <laughs> diets that do not have a lot of cookies and donuts, they're good for you. Low sugar diets are good for you. No question about that. Now, um, whether reducing the amount of sugar in your bloodstream over the course of a day can actually slow the aging process I think that's a plausibility and it's because of two papers. One of, well, one set of papers we have already published and one set that just got accepted almost, but not quite. It may be accepted sometime in the next few weeks, I hope. Uh, both of these use drugs. Acarbos is the one that was published uh, that, that actually blunt the, the um, peak in blood sugar after a meal. You don't get sugar into your blood by eating sugar. You get by eating bread and pasta and other complex carbohydrates uh, because your body breaks them down into sugars in the GI tract and you get a big peak in blood sugar, jumps to the ceiling once you have had your second or third slice of bread or a big helping of spaghetti or donut or two. Now a carbose gets into the gut and it blocks the breakdown of starches. It inhibits the enzyme that breaks the starches down. So when you have a lot of acarbose in you, that's why it's obviously such a good diabetic drug. When you have a lot of acarbose in you, you can eat the same few pieces of bread or, or, or pasta and the blood sugar goes up, but it never gets very high. It, it stays fairly close to baseline. It stays up for a long time because your body is slowly grinding through the starch but you, you avoid that, that peak. And what we've published for that drug and for another one that we hope will be accepted soon is that this extends mouse lifespan by, for the males, about 20% or more. These mice are not diabetic. We're not postponing diabetes in the mice. Most of the mice are dying of several different kinds of cancer. So the uh, acarbose treatment is postponing the cancer. It's postponing muscle loss. It's postponing uh, certain kinds of changes in inflammation in the brain, it's postponing um, changes in the uh, size of the left ventricle of the heart. It's really slowing the aging process down. Um, we're, we've just begun to study the other drug which also blunts uh, blood sugar peaks. This might be a pharmacological way of um, giving people a pill so that their blood sugar never gets way out of whack, way high. These are non-diabetic people, people like you and I, well, me and I hope you, uh, that don't have diabetes. So that's one, we don't know how it works. We don't know how blunting peak sugar seems in the mice to extend lifespan, but it does. And that's a big clue, something we want to follow up on. Alarmingly, the, uh, both of these two drugs, the published one and the unpublished one, work great in male mice and don't either don't work at all in female mice or work just a little bit in female mice. We have no idea why that is. Um, we would desperately like to know why the male mice can have their lifespan extended 20% and the females, it's 
statistically significant, but it's only 5%. I don't know why that is, and I would love to figure that out. Um, I think we ran through a lot of the forum questions. Uh, oh, here's another one. Would it be correct to say that current drugs and supplements known to extend lifespan are just poor substitute for exercise? Oh, that's easy. There are no drugs or nutritional supplements that are known to extend lifespan. Well, there you go. Um, I mean, what is it? assuming that you don't mean carrots and lettuce and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, and the anti-smoking pills. But yeah, uh, people who claim they have a drug or nutritional supplement that extends human lifespan are selling you a good, uh, a bill of goods. Exercise is good for you. I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, Christine, you were going to say something? Um, what has it been like communicating your research to the public? Like, is it well received or is it you know, a little bit more nuanced? That's a, that's a very important and sore point question. Uh, and the reason it's a sore point is that most of the public, by which I mean, you know, the people who think about this stuff at all and read an occasional article about science in the New York Times, that sort of person, I don't mean scientists, but the public with a lay interest in science, uh, members of the Congress who are on those committees, that, that sort of person, um, they are passionately interested in a cure for cancer, a cure for Alzheimer's, a cure for AIDS, a cure for, and they really haven't yet come to understand that if they actually care about these things, it's only aging research that can get them where they want to be. We have spent an enormous amount of money on a cure for cancer, hundredfold more at least than we've spent on basic aging research, probably a thousandfold more. And we're nowhere. We don't have a cure for cancer at all or a way to prevent it. The same is true for Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's budget is approximately half of the aging institute's budget and budget for my kind of stuff, basic biology of aging is, uh, you know, one one hundredth at most of that. That's being quite generous. And yet we, after 25 or 30 years of this, we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's, we don't have a prevention for Alzheimer's, we don't have a batch of people that agree on what, what, uh, how to tell whether someone has Alzheimer's while the brain is still inside their head. But what we do know is that the basic aging research, the stuff we do in my lab and a couple dozen other labs around the country, can slow all these diseases together, at least in mice. And so you can't slow any of those diseases, even in mice, one disease at a time. Uh, I've, I've sometimes have this uh, sort of fantasy that I go to whoever's in charge of NIH and say, hey, great, we have a way to postpone breast cancer so that the animals that are extremely old, their chances of breast cancer are way, way lower than they are in normal animals. Can we maybe study that? The answer, of course, is yeah, everybody wants to slow breast cancer. And then we say, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the same treatment slows the development of cataracts, but that's okay, isn't it? As a side effect, slowing cancer and cataracts together, that's, that's all right, right? And of course it is, as a side effect, slowing cataracts is great. And they say, oh, I forgot to mention, it also slows down the degeneration of cognitive function. So these animals treated with my special secret drug, they stay smart for a very long time. That's a side effect of our anti, it's an anti-cancer treatment, and eventually they figure out that what I'm really talking about, I've tricked them into thinking about an anti-aging drug, which is not what I was alleging. I was alleging I had an anti-cancer drug. So they kicked me out of the office. Uh, if, if people who are interested in these one disease at a time sort of things, these one disease at a time people, if they realize that their way of doing things is not working and our way of doing things is working, just possibly they would have an interest in aging research. I think in order to get there, we need to take the people who spend the money, the administrators and the people who run the Congress and the voters uh, to recognize this fact and change their ideas. You know, if, if a politician, a president, Obama or Trump or Biden goes on TV and says, I'm gonna pledge a moonshot, we're gonna cure cancer. His 
uh, popularity goes up enormously. But if they make the same speech and say, we're going to slow down aging through my research program, that's considered crazy, right? You can't slow down aging. That's nuts. I think we need to change that. Uh, there's an article I wrote on exactly that topic, which appeared in the Millbank Quarterly in 2002. Um, I'll be glad to send a copy of Aaron, and it can be Aaron's responsibility to send it to everyone. Sure. Now, there are a lot of people here who are too shy to ask questions. What if, do you think it would help, Aaron, if I offered to send them a nice bottle of rapamycin for every question? Do you think that would help? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Christine. Um, somebody had a, had a question about uh, <clears throat> cryonics. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. or I, I, I think you were uh, maybe looking for another question to ask as well. Emre, is that the question you want to ask? All right, yes. I was curious about your stance on cryonics, if it makes sense to, to try, even if it is not proved. But yeah, also I was searching another question, which relates to group selection, I guess, because uh, it has been told to me by, I don't know if a scientist or a non-scientist, by a guy on the internet, that it is possible that um, a shortened lifespan uh, could be selected if it is non-adaptive for a group. But I'm skeptical of that, and I wanted to know what- Yes, you are right to be skeptical. There's a huge body of quantitative research debunking that idea. Um, I'm, you want me to be frank and honest? I think cryonics is, is a silly idea. Um, we, we, we don't have the slightest ability uh, to preserve even something more as complex as a fruit fly um, um, a cryonically. Um, the notion that if you cut somebody's head off and put it in a, a, a vat of nutrient, everything's just going to be fine. Um, that's, that's wish fulfillment. Uh, it it's, makes for great science fiction. I love reading science fiction, but as a serious topic for scientific thought, not, not worth the airtime. I actually agree with this stance, but that was like not my question because I think it is not really a topic of discussion that we, we do not have ways to um, perform cryonics successfully on any anything, any living being. Uh, today, but the point of cryonics is, is the question, we will, will we be able to do it in the future? Because if we will be able to do it, to do it in the future, then it makes sense to do it now and, and, and wait, basically. And so it's a bet more than a yeah, I, sure I guess thing. Yeah, all right, I, I want to know why. Um, well, not only is there no evidence that uh, a complex structure can be frozen and revived with gain of complex uh, function, um, but the amount of money that goes into that sort of thing is a distraction from spending the money on sensible, real research. We know quite well what it takes to um, maintain cognitive function, for instance. Uh, we know that the cells, for instance, can't have crystalline deposits within them that break all of their cell membranes. Um, we understand that mitochondria are damaged by freezing and that thawing them will hurt mitochondria. So although it's obvious that I, I would love to see science working on um, helping me grow wings so that I can fly around. It would save me an awful lot of frequent flyer miles. I, I don't spend a lot of time asking anyone whether 100 or 200 or 500 years from now, I'll be able to grow wings. It's just a waste of, of, uh, of uh, CPU cycles to do it. Oh, uh, <coughs> oh sorry. sorry I'll... Okay. I, I wanted to add on to that. Um, so I spoke to the founder, or uh, yeah, a couple of the founders of Alcor, and uh, they have no interest in actually figuring out how to defrost the bodies correctly. 
they want to freeze everything, but they don't have any interest in researching how to um, revive the bodies after they're frozen. So if you're a cryonics company <clears throat> and you're trying to uh, freeze bodies to resuscitate them, it might behoove one to uh, actually figure out how to do that. And I figured that their strategy was eventually to- Their motivation is not to thaw people. Their motivation right. is to get money. They've got money for doing that. Right. So That's working beautifully. <laughs> It's a bit speculative. About something yeah, so other than like, cryonics, please. Until you have a true proof of concept. <laughs> sure. I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, I was just adding that it's a bit speculative until you have a true proof of concept with the thawing included. Good point. I don't want to talk about cryonics anymore. Does someone have a, a question about something else? Yes, I'm curious um, how much machine learning models have assisted any of your genomics research or, or, any, or anything of the sort? That's a good question. Um, so I was at a meeting maybe a year, year and a half ago that was designed to talk about the role of machine learning or more generally artificial intelligence, uh, broadly, more broadly speaking, in aging research. And they did a great job They invite, uh, putting the meeting together. They put together 10 or 15 of us that did aging research and another 10 or 15 people who had done various kinds of absolutely cutting edge work in artificial intelligence. And, and the, the AI people were able to present success stories in, in, in important but limited domains, like looking at x-rays for signs of cancer or reading EKGs for signs of, uh, of uh, uh, early fibrillation, atrial fibrillation, et cetera. They're, they're, the, they're the best at what they did. And the meeting, though I, I learned a lot <laughs> about AI, it was obvious that no one had the slightest notion about how to apply machine learning or more broadly AI concepts uh, to aging research. All the AI people, when they took us away for lunch, they would say, now, can you give me please a problem I can solve? <laughs> and we wanted to ask them the same thing. Can you give me any example of a problem in aging research that you guys think you might be able to solve? What if I gave you this data set? What if I gave you that data set? What if I gave you that data set? And uh, this, the intersection of these two sets of ideas was, was nil. Um, I, I think it may well be that um, a collaboration between really smart aging researchers and cutting edge AI people deserves, uh, could, could get us somewhere interesting. Uh, you need to find people who not only are skilled engineers and, and statisticians and programmers, but who are also willing to listen to the right people in aging research. The, the group that I got closest to was a group at Google. Uh, they were really good at using algorithms for, for instance, picking out Stalin's face in a set of 10,000 people, okay? Uh, they were doing pattern recognition, facial recognition, which has obvious great commercial and practical utility. And they wanted to apply this to aging research and they'd been seduced by someone who was absolutely convinced that senescence, senescence, cell senescence was sort of vaguely the same thing as aging. And so they wanted to talk about whether they could use the same algorithms for telling whether cells were senescent. And to my mind, that's a, almost a useless thing to do. <laughs> but that's, they had hooked up with people who were really convinced that cell senescence and aging were sort of the same thing and that whatever made you senescent in culture was going to cure aging for you. Um, so for their point of view, developing algorithms for quickly determining at a glance whether a cell was senescent or not would be useful. That, 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 that's a sort of topic in which machine learning and, and more broadly AI uh, advances. One can see it making an important uh, but having an important benefit for a lot of different kinds of aging research, but it has to be good aging research too. I'm not yet aware of any success in that field, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lot of successes in that field in the next five or 10 years. Aaron, a there's a question, question by Yeah, Jojo. I'm reading that. So um, in, the, in the chat, uh, somebody has asked, 
Any prospects in the ITP program for periodic rapamycin administration rather than daily use to assess longevity, such as was done by Lamming Lab to reduce mTOR2 inhibition? I happen to know the answer to that. The paper was accepted on Monday. It was accepted for, uh, six days ago. So um, yes, uh, we, we did that study. We took mice that were See, is it at an embargo journal? No. So uh, we took uh, mice that were 20 months of age. Some of them got rapamycin until the end of their lives and they lived longer. That's what rapamycin does for mice. So that was good. Some of them got rapamycin for just three months. We gave them rapamycin at 20 and we took it away at 23. And here we had a sexual dimorphism. The females didn't do them any good at all. They were like normal. The males gave them a small but significant lifespan extension. And the third thing we did was the one you just suggested. We gave it to them for one month, then off for one month, then on for one month, then off for one month. And here, uh, for the males, it was just as good at, as giving rabomycin all the way through. And for the females, it was half as good. <laughs> so again, we had sexual dimorphism, but it worked for males and females. So um, it may have to do with exactly when you start and how many months it's on and how many months it's off. They're, you know, the females in our kind of mice, they live on average, just normal females, about two months or three months longer than males. So maybe we would have had a better effect on females if we started a little later or something like that. You can make up a story. But the, the basic answer is that the on, off, on, off thing, um, had a, a full effect in males and a partial effect in females. Obviously doing on, off, on, off, starting at four months or starting at eight months or starting at 12 months. These are studies I would really like to do or like someone to do. Each of these studies is expensive. You've got to have money and you have to have, you know, every, every time we pick drugs, we have 10 or 15 or 20 good ideas, but enough money to test about seven of them. So testing on, off, on, off is, a good idea. Testing it again at younger ages is a good idea. It's uh, not an easy question to decide whether it's the best idea or in the top seven good ideas uh, that year. Hopefully other labs will get into this as well. We're, the ITP is not the only group that uh, is allowed to do aging studies, uh, you know, drug and aging studies. I had a final question. Have there been any attempts to exhaustively list the root mechanisms of aging? Well, earlier on in the talk, I think I answered a related question by saying there are, because there are no mechanisms of aging. What there might be, and this I think is the closest I can do to a satisfactory answer for your question, there might be a root mechanism for slowing aging down. It's clear that orangutans, gorillas, and people are really good at slowing aging down. It's not clear whether we all do it in the same way, but that seems plausible to me. It's not clear whether long-lived birds like ostriches and albatross and fulmars all have the same way of slowing aging down. And it's certainly not clear whether the root mechanism of slowing aging down in the birds is the same as it is in primates. I would like that to be true. That's why we're working on it. We don't quite know the answer yet. On, on the side of yes, as the answer to that question, um, we've now found at least three things, an enzyme, uh, a proteasome substitution, uh, and a response to peroxide in which the same changes occur in long-lived birds, long-lived primates, long-lived rodents, and in some cases, long live other mammals that aren't rodents and primates. So that can't be coincidence. If, if in order to make a long lived bird, you do the same thing, you turn on this enzyme, thyroid oxygen reductase two, or you turn on this particular proteasome protein. Um, nature did it at least four times, once in each of those four clades, not by chance. That's a really strong indication that turning that on is a critical element in evolving a long lived species. So, once we have a list of five or six or seven or eight of those, what I want to ask is what do they have in common? For instance, 
if all of those turn out to be controlled by a single transcription factor, then we're there. Then we have a sense that this trans hypothetical, it's not discovered, hypothetical transcription factor slows down these five things in long-lived birds and the same five things in long-lived primates and the same five things in long-lived rodents and long-lived um, lions and tigers and naked mole rats and stuff. So that would be, that's the sort of ideal breakthrough where we want to look at not the root mechanisms of aging, but the root mechanisms in the anti-aging process that evolution has known about for millions of years and which we hope or think or suspect our drugs and the calorie restriction diet and the methionine restriction diet uh, and the IGF-1 growth hormone system are all slowing down together. Um, I have a question. Um, I would like to know um, at what point uh, fasting become uh, a negative? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's an experimentally addressable question. Um, in mice, for instance, or rats, I guess it's been done most in rats. If you give them 20% calorie restriction, they live 20% longer. 30%, they get live about 30% longer. Same for 40%. If you go to 55%, they uh, lose weight and die. So not at all surprisingly, um, you can find a level of caloric intake which is incompatible with good health the level is going to depend on what species you are, what kind of calories they are, you know, the balance between protein and, and carbohydrates, et cetera. It's also going to depend upon whether you're growing or whether uh, you are already, whether you're a mature adult or even whether you are obese, all of these, um, and what species you are. <laughs> um, so there's no single magic number, but sure, if you withdraw calories and keep going lower and lower and lower and lower, eventually, uh, you find a place where the animal starves to death. Thanks. Yep. Okay, uh, any other questions? I think we're close to the end, but we have uh, a few minutes, I think, for anything else. I'm curious about something. If um... For anybody who's watching who's um, an anti-aging enthusiast and maybe wants to play a part in shifting um, the, I guess, maybe creating societal acceptance that aging is the biggest risk factor right. and that we ought to funnel resources over there and support right. researchers like yourself, what are some things that you suggest we do? For example, like Aaron's um, interviews. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, and I think it has to be a broad spectrum. Um, again, this article in the Mill Bank Quarterly that I'm going to send Aaron for distribution goes into that to some extent. But the basic idea is uh, the educated non-scientific public has to see aging research as an important avenue towards the development of new preventive medicines for humans. There's a batch of stuff that makes that really tough. Uh, one of the things that makes it really tough is that most of the people who say they have something that slows the aging process are lying. They are trying to make money, or if they're not trying to make money, they are trying to gain personal notoriety and fame and uh, get invited uh, to participate in national meetings. So the, the lay public, which has very difficulty separating good science from bad science, views that stuff and says, eh, it sounds a little crackpot. And they're right, it is crackpot. And so they don't want to have anything to do with this topic. That has to change. Um, then in addition, um, it has to be understood by those who have the flexibility to fund public science that this is the way to achieve results in prevention of the diseases they care about. So if the Cancer Society says, makes a loud public noise, we are gonna spend 5% or 8% of our research budget on aging research because aging research will slow cancer 
and the Alzheimer's Society says the same thing, and the Lymphoma Society says the same thing. That sort of swelling of enthusiasm for looking at how aging can be used to prevent diseases so far in, in rodent models, but eventually we hope in humans as well. That's not a big jump. Um, that, that sort of support will eventually, I hope, gain the attention of, of public science that is congressionally mandated uh, NIH funded research. I don't think pharmaceutical companies are a source of real research support here because they make a lot of money selling schlock uh, as um, nutritional supplements and because actually testing an anti-aging drug in humans is expensive and would take two decades or three decades. The only thing I can imagine is it, there's, some of these drugs may well slow the aging process and prevent disease in pets, in dogs. Uh, there's a, as most of you may know, there's one ongoing study of, by some really good people to see if rapamycin can slow aging in dogs. And it will give us answers in about five years. They start with five-year-old dogs. And when the dogs are 10 years old, we'll have a pretty good sense of what's working. I, I wish they hadn't started with rapamycin. I wish they had started with acarbos, for instance. But um, more of that is good. Uh, doing three or four or five such studies uh, are affordable and very informative. And if we wake up 10 years from now and there is a clear, strong signal that one or two or three of these drugs given to middle-aged dogs helps the dog stay healthy and happy and active an extra 20% of the normal dog lifespan, then I think that is almost certain to catch the public's attention. That would be a good wave to, to start to ride. I actually have one more question, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, so if it's true that um, there is no such thing as aging mechanisms, what is it that preventative medicine is supposed to prevent? There are all sorts of mechanisms that cause bad stuff in old folks, <laughs> right? Yeah. Cell death and tooth decay and cross-linking and stuff like that. And the mechanisms that cause late life disease they're important, they're well worth studying. A lot of people are studying them. I, I think that's a terrific idea. Um, what I think one needs also to study in enormous detail is the mechanisms that can postpone the effects of aging in so many different systems. These are not mechanisms that cause the bad stuff that we call aging. They're mechanisms that delay it all at the same time. That's what I'd like to study. Okay. Um, so I think that we are at the end of the time and uh, we appreciate you use, uh, <laughs> spending the time here to talk with everybody. Yeah, glad to help. And Once two been... or three of you are senators or members of the House of Representatives <laughs> or the Secretary of Housing and Human Services, uh, sorry, Health and uh, Human Welfare, uh, just call me and uh, we'll, we'll work something out. All right. Um, and that, uh, I think, concludes the thank you. meeting. And I uh, thank, thank everybody for writing. being Bye -bye. here. This has been the largest turnout so far. So, all right. <laughs>